Hello, my name is Marcus Brandt. I'm the head of mission of International Idea for Myanmar. And today I have the pleasure to talk to uh, Professor Andrew Harding. Uh, and we are here at uh, Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, where Professor Harding will have a lecture later this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to talk about Myanmar, a country that you know very well. Uh, but you have, of course, uh, many years of experience of comp comparative constitutional law, uh, Asian legal studies. You have been at uh, National University of Singapore for many years, where you led the Center for Asian Legal Studies. And uh, you are one of the renowned figures when it comes to constitutional law, constitutionalism uh, in Asia and, uh, and beyond. So uh, I'm very glad that we can talk about uh, uh, recent developments in Myanmar today, because you are not only following Myanmar, but you've also, mm. uh, we've actually collaborated some years ago uh, in when you edited the book on constitutionalism in Myanmar, uh, focusing very much on the 2008 constitution, mm. uh, which was the uh, legal framework uh, at the time. And uh, I still remember many good discussions around the complicated uh, features of the 2008 mm. constitution. Uh, now we are in a different phase already. We are looking into the future, but I would like to also talk to, to you a bit about looking backwards into the constitutional history of Myanmar and the constitutional mm -hmm. traditions, and in particular the uh, the lack of uh, rootedness of constitutionalism and how that affects the current uh, discussions on uh, creating a new constitutional framework. Uh, but uh, welcome to this conversation, basically, and uh, uh, maybe let's start with a general view on uh, looking back at Myanmar from a constitutional perspective. What has been your experience as a legal scholar uh, on doing constitutional research work in, in Myanmar, and how would you sort of uh, compare that with other countries? All right. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to, to talk to you about these issues and you yourself have a, a broad, deep knowledge of, of, of them as well. So this is a great opportunity and uh, thank, thank you so much. Um, well, I suppose, I suppose one could start with the 1947 constitution in force in 1948, some people call it 1948 constitution, um, which was um, what, like the Indian constitution was drafted by the people themselves, by the Burmese. It was not a, it was not a, a constitution imposed by uh, the British or, or any sort of external force. And so that was the first occasion on which uh, the Burmese people were able to consider, consider how they wanted to be governed. And um, I, I was looking back at that constitution the other day and and, and thinking that, that actually it, it gives us some pretty good ideas and good precedents in a number of areas. If you think about a future constitution being both federal and democratic, which is what uh, seems to be uh, expected of mm. whatever the next constitution will be, it would at least fulfill those two uh, objectives. There's a lot that we can learn from that, that first uh, post-war constitution. Uh, in terms of, for ex of democratic institutions, uh, in terms of the rule of law, in terms of territorial governance, which obviously is always going to be a big issue in in Myanmar because of um, you know the long history of, of problems in in that uh, area. So um, I, I think there's much we can think about. Of course, it was a constitution of its period, and we'd be thinking about a constitution many decades after that, and we have so much more experience of, of, of these issues. So I think it would be a good moment to bring to bear not just um, Burmese constitutional history or Myanmar constitutional history, but also the constitutional ideas that are current in the world generally and the experience of other countries. I mean, we've talked about Indonesia and Malaysia and mm. India and, uh, and other countries where there's relevant experience. So, um, and I think maybe one important aspect of what happened in the 1940s was the, the famous Panglong Conference where General Aung San uh, reached a kind of an agreement with, with at least some of the major ethnic groups, not all of them, but it, it promised um, a, a degree of 
kind of trust between the center and the periphery. Um, but unfortunately, as we know, General Long San was assassinated. And, and so that trust was immediately kind of ruptured and has never really been uh, properly restored, mm. I think, ever ever since then. And, and so we have a problem, how do you, how do you re recreate that trust? But there was a moment where, uh, you know, it seemed possible to solve these kind of inter-ethnic problems in a constitutional way. So we can derive some encouragement from that. The 1974 constitution is the next one. I think we can probably pass that over that pretty quickly because that was a constitution designed for a one-party socialist state. It was not democratic um, in any sense that we recognize that term these days. And so I don't think there's a great deal to be learned, to be honest, from that constitution, although it did bring in the idea of having seven states and seven regions. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that then reappeared in the 2008 constitution. And this problem, as I said, of territorial governance is probably the major problem that you would have to solve in the next constitutional stage. So perhaps we can just fast forward to the 2008 constitution, um, which, well, First question is, I suppose, does is that constitution operative at this mm. moment? We could have an interesting discussion mm -hmm. on that, on that question. Um, but, but moving forward from that, obviously, it's an important precedent in some ways. The same as with the 1947 constitution, more so perhaps in some respects. But yet, in other respects, it represents principles that I think almost universally people would now want to reject. And I'm thinking primarily of the role of the military under that constitution, which um, has been a problem throughout right up until now, um, when that constitution is really, how would, you, how would you describe it, Marcus? It's sort of in a state of limbo. It kind of uh, is used to justify certain things. I mean, the election of the uh, of the parliament and so on under that constitution. The military tries to use it to justify its coup as emergency powers under that constitution. Uh, but there's problems with both of those propositions, I think. So we have to think ahead and learn from the lessons of the 2008 constitution. And so obviously the the unusual aspect of that constitution was it, that it gave this massive role to the military. And the, if you think back to 2008, that constitution was almost universally criticized outside of Myanmar for mainly this reason, that it is what people call a Praetorian constitution, um, you know, meaning that the military um, uh, has a kind of tutelage position mm. over the democratic institutions. Mm. And so uh, um, we had this situation where the military occupied 25% of the seats in both houses of parliament and in the state and regional assemblies as well. They occupied the, one of the vice president, one of the two vice mm -hmm. uh, president um, positions. Um, and then they had constitutionally control over certain important por portfolios in the government. Um, so it's a very kind of militarized constitution. And this 25% matter is particularly crucial because as you will recall from our discussions previously, which you referred to, um, in, order to in order to amend the constitution, you need more than 75% in favor of the relevant bill in both houses of parliament, um, which, uh, which means in effect that the military could veto any constitutional amendment. Well, why is constitutional amendment important? Well, because opposition forces, the NLD and so on, um, you know, saw this constitution not as a good constitution, but as, as a platform for changing the constitutional system into something better. Mm 
than the 2008 constitution. But there was an enormous roadblock in the way because the military commander was able simply to direct uh, his people in the parliament, you know, not to support uh, an amendment. One or two small things did get through, but they were not very controversial. Mm. Uh, and therefore, any major changes um, simply could not happen unless the military agreed. But they were the very changes that the military would never agree to, um, making the constitution more federal, more democratic, uh, and, and so on. Um, and so we had a curious situation, didn't we, between, say, the election of the first civilian government in 2010, right up until the coup of 1st of February 2021, in which you had in operation a democratic system, but um, the military had this enormous power, and there was always the possibility that they could, as it were, pull the plug on democracy when they did not find its outcomes you know, uh, to its liking. Uh, and bring the whole process to an end. That was hanging like a sword of Damocles over everybody during, you know, for that 10 or 11 years. And of course, that is ev eventually what uh, actually, uh, actually happened. Um, and that, I suppose, was because there was no possible agreed solution to the problems. The NLD wanted fundamental change. Um, the military did not want it and had the power to block it constitutionally. Therefore, there was no constitutional path forward um, from where things had, had got to um, following the election in November 2020. Mm. So that's why we are very unfortunately and tragically in the the situation um, that that we are uh, that we are now. So there was constant critique of this constitution. That and and this is a problem that you have to confront with any constitution. What is the process for constitutional change? I mean, no constitution is the final word on everything. Obviously, you need to be able to ch change it in the light of experience or or new preferences and desires and situations and so on. Um, so you, you have to, in a way, compromise between stability and flexibility. You don't want complete flexibility betokens instability. Um, complete uh, rigidity means it's just frozen in time. Mm. And that's exactly what the problem was. Mm. Um, you know, looking back just a few years, mm -hmm. that was the, the situation that we, were, that we were facing. And constitutional amendment is something we're talking about this afternoon, so mm. it's very mm. uh, very relevant. So that's, that is a crucial point. How easy or hard should it be to amend the constitution once you've drafted it? That is already a problem, mm. uh, a, a big problem um, in itself. Um, so that, that, is the, that, that is the experience. And, and as I see it, when you eventually get to the next stage, there are so many problems that need to be solved. And it, I think experience internationally shows that to draft a new constitution for a new regime situation, there needs to be an underlying political settlement. Uh, you cannot leapfrog straight into a constitutional uh, 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 drafting situation unless there's some agreement on what the fundamental principles should be. Mm. So the first task is to do that and then the constitutional lawyers and so on uh, come in to try and give effect to that in, in constitutional terms. But as, as people often say, the constitution is far too important to be left to lawyers. So, mm. you know, there has to be a democratic element and consult mm. consultative exercise in, mm. in doing this. What I always found quite curious about Myanmar's history is that basically since the creation of Burma as an independent state, it has spent uh, more than half of its lifetime without a constitution in place, actually under military autocratic rule, as we also uh, see at the moment, at least in those parts controlled by the military. So the challenge, as you say, is not only to write a new constitutional text, but to actually create something like a culture of constitutionalism mm -hmm. for making the constitution mm -hmm. actually matter. And that is a, a completely different challenge from 
lawyer sitting together drafting a text because that is yes. actually building the roots into society, making it matter, making constitutional fundamental rights matter and being actually enforceable. Um, the checks and balances or in an independent judiciary actually using its constitutional powers. And in particular, when we move into constitutionally protected federalism uh, and maybe even local government, constitutional provisions need to matter in a way that they have never have mm. in the past. Yes. Now, where do you, how do you, how can we tackle this challenge of building constitutionalism rather than just drafting a new constitution for Myanmar? That's the $64,000 question, uh, isn't it? You, you've hit the nail absolutely on the head. And, and, and maybe for those viewing, uh, listening to this, um, constitutionalism is, uh, is not the same thing as having a constitution. I mean, you can, you can have a constitution which basically people don't follow. It's not really entrenched. It's not meaningful because it doesn't, you, you, it doesn't embody constitutionalism. Rather oddly, you can have constitutionalism without a constitution. The UK, for example, doesn't have a, a written constitution, but has a long tradition of constitutionalism. And therefore, you're right, the constitutionalism is ultimately more important. You, you, you have to get your constitutional arrangements right. We're not saying this is not significant. It's highly significant. But it has to reflect the underlying reality. Uh, and what we mean by constitutionalism is a system where, um, where people actually internalize and do follow the rules and principles of the constitutional order. And therefore, the constitution reflects reality and reality reflects the constitution. Where you get problems is when those things pull apart and the constitution, as you say, ceases to mean anything. But I think it's important to understand that even in countries that have, you know, many centuries of experience of this, we still struggle with these issues. We struggle in America with, you know, presidential immunity and the rule of law, for example, and uh, with the electoral system and all sorts of issues. So it's not as though you reach for a perfect system and then you make sure that everybody understands it and complies with it because it's always going to be an ongoing process. So how to answer this very difficult question? Um, well, let's say the first point, I think, is that there is a period of about 14 years between 1948 and 1962 when constitutionalism was operating uh, in, in Myanmar. Um, some historians might say, well, that didn't really work out too well. And as you know, there was a coup by General Ne Win in 1962. So there was a coup in 1962 that brought to an end that system of constitutional government. And as you say, mainly from that point onwards, there was no constitution and there was no constitutionalism. There was simply a developing culture of people following the orders of the military. And, and, uh, and I think we know from conversations in Myanmar that, that this kind of culture became deeply entrenched and overlaid the original situation of constitutional government, which was perceived not to have been successful, primarily because of inter-ethnic difficulties and, and conflicts which have continued almost, you know, right up until, um, uh, until today. Um, so um, it, it, it isn't easy to create that situation. But if we look at other examples around the world, you take, say, South Africa in 1993 to 96, it seemed like an insoluble conflict was taking place, what inev inevitably would result in civil war. But enlightened leadership managed to bring the parties together to reach agreement on how to move forward without violence. And looking back, it's almost astonishing that this really worked very successfully because you had people on, 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 on all sides who realized, well, you have to work with the other side. You, mm. can't, you can't get everything you want. Mm. 
And, and so you then subscribe to certain basic principles. Everybody agrees, you know, it should be democratic, it should be rule of law, there should be, you know, provincial powers and, and all sorts of other things. I mean, measures to kind of redress the economic balance in the country and to do away with uh, racism in government and that sort of thing. And, and so <clears throat> there was a basis on which you, then you could draft a constitution that reflected those principles. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, I know there are problems in South Africa, but, but that system basically has applied since 1996 and has provided for stability and continuity. So it's not impossible mm. to, to do this. Um, but there are also various, shall we say, experiences across the world in terms of, well, what, what are the forces or what are the conditions to sort of entrench the idea of constitutionalism? Education is obviously one thing. Um, and, and, and I do think here that we fall generally very far short in terms of teaching young people in school, maybe from an early age, about these kind of civic issues. I mean, I don't know what happens in a lot of countries, but you know, when I was at school, we had courses on civics where you mm. learned about how to be a citizen mm. in society. They don't seem to do that very much these days. That should be brought back in because otherwise people think, well, the constitution, that's something for lawyers to study because you have litigation and so on, and it's useful to know the rules that apply to government and things like that. We'll leave all that to lawyers. But as I said, it's much much more important than that. I mean, it has to be taken on board by, by everybody. Everybody has to take it seriously. Voters, officials, politicians, not just lawyers, judges, and then educators as well. So I think we, we, we can do a much better job in terms of educating um, the public. Um, we can have, uh, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary education, but also public education on these issues. Mm. And as you know, in Myanmar, people have been discussing these issues the last few years in a very, you know, informed and uh, positive way mm. and realizing that their futures actually do depend on understanding these fundamental principles, like what is federalism, for example, and how could that be implemented in such a way that would give a degree of autonomy um, to the, um, you know, to the ethnic states? And would they be able to trust the system that gave them that autonomy? What does that imply? Well, it implies um, that people have an understanding about um, you know, what uh, powers and what resources go to that level and that you have institutions like the courts to enforce that and make mm. sure that it happens in practice mm. uh, and that people don't try to subvert the system by, you know, refusing to give those powers or grabbing mm. them back or, or refusing money in order for them to mm. be carried out. So, it, you know, it, it's it, constitutionalism as I see it, contains two important elements. What I would call it legal constitutionalism and political constitutionalism. And obviously, that which is legal has political consequences, and that which is political has legal consequences. So we can't always separate, separate them out terribly clearly. But political constitutionalism is you know, the understanding of how the process of government is supposed to work. Um, democratic elections, representation, accountability to parliament, a basic understanding of, of the rule of law that, you know, people go according to uh, the rules, not what they think can be negotiated or what might work in practice, but what, what the rules actually provide for. When it comes to things like appointment of a new government, uh, appointment of, of, of judges and ministers and all, all of that sort of uh, process that carries on. Basically, the, the, pros, the political process mm. of constructing a government and uh, implementing politics in terms of democratic consent and accountability. Then we have legal constitutionalism, which obviously we constitutional lawyers tend to uh, emphasize that part of it probably too much, I think. But mm. uh, this is where we talk about individual rights and citizens' rights and about uh, 
judicial independence, we think, is very, very important in order to have the rule of law, which is fundamentally related to legal constitutionalism, mm. the idea of equality before the law, you know, that doesn't matter who you are, what are your status or your wealth or your, or your lack of status or wealth, you still have that equality, the same as every other citizen before the law. Very easy to say, very difficult to mm. do. Look at the situation with former President Trump in America mm. right now. Even America is struggling with the rule of law in this situation. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy. Um, but you need to have uh, very strong legal ed uh, education, I think. And I would hope that people learning in other disciplines would take these principles on board uh, as well. Mm. Often uh, courses in these areas like political science don't actually um, study these things very mm. carefully. Um, that needs to be done. And I think experience shows that you need a strong and competent legal profession that is willing to stand up for the rule of law, constitutionalism, mm. fundamental rights, in the way that they have in Malaysia, for example, mm. over many years. It's been a strong bastion of the, the rule of law mm. based on their, their, you know, their, their social orientation and their knowledge and their, and their, and their legal, uh, legal practice. So whatever the constitutional outcome of the design in the next few years, it makes sense to invest in legal education, in spreading civic rights, understanding, civic awareness, because that can be just a good, useful thing, whatever features and, and forms the future constitution will take. Can yes. I ask you more specifically about uh, to speak to the role of a constitutional court or some kind of, mm. or a Supreme Court that has a, a constitutional review function and what role it can play specifically in uh, sort of bringing about uh, legal constitutionalism. And th this is a very important factor because, and I think this is relevant both to legal and to political constitutionalism, to have a means of enforcing what the constitution says. And uh, as you well know, because you're Austrian, Hans Kelsen, the famous Austrian scholar, was uh, was the one who really developed this idea of having a branch of government that had this judicial function but was distinct from the ordinary judiciary because its job was only to enforce the constitution. And that's been adopted in, I think, about 60-odd countries across the world over the last 100 years or so, and especially in the last 30 years uh, that that has happened, including in, in Myanmar, because you have the constitutional tribunal under the 2008 constitution. So there's already a precedent there. Mm. And if you look at some of its decisions are actually very good. And so there's a kind of an experience mm. there. That experience can be developed a lot further. But the point is that you need to have an authoritative body. This is pure Kelsen, right? You need to have a body which has the judicial authority to enforce the rules in particular cases and to interpret what the constitution means because mm. constitutions are not self-executing mm. because first of all you have to say well how does it apply what does it actually mean in this particular context and no amount of brilliant draftsmanship can answer uh, mm. you know these questions of mm. interpretation Obviously, many countries don't have a constitutional court, but they have a Supreme Court, like in the United States, in the UK, and in other countries, India, for example, which has a similar function alongside its ordinary judicial functions. But, um, but it, it does essentially act as a constitutional court. Mm -hmm. And so it has to have a strong reputation and ability. It has to be something that people would put trust in because ultimately that court is your guarantee that the constitution is what will actually happen. Mm. So it's very important to have an institution of that kind mm. to authoritatively enforce the constitution. Mm. We are already towards the end of our uh, discussion, but I would uh, not uh, like to miss the opportunity to ask you specifically on the relationship between 
uh, federal unit level constitutions and the federal constitution. You're uh, preparing a, a book, I believe, to be published later this year on subnational governance in various Asian countries that will look into some of these questions, including Myanmar. So we're very much looking forward to that. At the moment, there is a big discussion in Myanmar about subnational federal unit mm. constitutions and how they would interact with the federal constitution and in particular the sequence of when they would have to be in place and which sort of uh, relationship there will be between the federal units and the federation. Could you just briefly comment on in a functioning federal country, mm -hmm. so to say, uh, what is what are the things to be to be kept in mind in terms of the relationship between the federal constitution and the unit level constitutions? Uh, this is a very big topic, Marcus. We should probably do another <laughs> another <should>. video <laughs> on this question because it's immensely complex and uh, it does tend to be re reduced wrongly, I think, to a sort of simple equation of, well, it's either federal or it's unitary. The situation is much more complex. Many unitary states have federal elements. Federal states usually have some unitary elements. So it's, a, it's as I said, it is a spectrum and you have to choose where on the spectrum you want to be, not simply is it one thing or the other thing. It's, not, it's much more than a binary choice. Um, uh, sequencing is particularly difficult. Do we proceed with federalism on the basis that each unit enjoys sovereignty? Uh, or are the units the creation of a constitutional system that you now construct in order to achieve that result? So where you start from is critically important, but critically difficult, because are people going to have the idea, well, we have our own sovereignty, and we surrender it with some suspicion to any other, uh, any other body or structure of government? Or do we expect that this structure will deliver the autonomy that we hope that we will gain um, from it. So what is the, the starting point? We need to have clear understandings on that starting point. Then we have to have very good decisions about how to structure this. In the context of Myanmar, it seems to me it would have to be a very loose federation for the simple reason that you, know, you can have a centralized form of federalism. Malaysia, again, is a good example of that. In many ways, it's not really federal. That will not do in Myanmar because I don't think that those ethnic states would trust giving strong power to the center. They might trust a system that gives them, um, you know, it's a centrifugal situation where, where power is given to them within this structure mm. rather than surrendered um, to, to that kind of central mm. government, which has always been a problem right from the beginning and right up until now in Myanmar. And, and so that comes back to your previous question about enforcement. So you need to have trust in a strong method of enforcement that would ensure that the center does not encroach on the rights of the, mm. of the states mm. or, or regions. Mm. Um, so that entails a lot of constitutional provisions that we have to think about. But alongside that, Experience shows that federations work best where there's cooperation. Mm. Cooperation also depends on trust. Mm. So there's a little bit of a contradiction mm. here. The, the, it has to be centrifugal, giving autonomy to the states and regions, but also centripetal in the sense that you recognize there is a need to cooperate with the center. Mm. If you have something like COVID, for example, how are you going to deal with that unless you cooperate? Mm. It's inconceivable. So you need to have those mechanisms to make sure that you know, funding is, is fairly and properly distributed between the various units, just for example. But in every way, you need to have an element of what we call cooperative federalism. Mm. It's not easy to achieve any of this. Mm. Well, thank you very much. And we will certainly continue the conversation on some of these very tricky issues in universities and outside. Uh, and uh, for now, let's uh, conclude here. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you very much for watching this uh, video. Uh, we will post a few links to interesting articles and the references. And please watch out for Professor Andrew Harding's publications and uh, articles and uh, contributions. Uh, he certainly has a lot to say on Myanmar and other countries. Thank you. Mm.